to a certain extent, Web 3.0 is back to the future. When we started looking at a lot of the value uh, that was accumulating around the internet was around user contributed content. So it was about what the users were creating. Now, again, to many of us, who, the, what academics were doing with the original early in the early internet was sharing our papers, which is you know we're sharing our content. That's what we do. We write papers and do research, and we were using it. We were the suppliers of the of the service, and then big service providers came along to provide news and other things. Uh, but then it was realised that a lot of the content was arising from the individuals out there. But at this point, it was now getting aggregated into these large platforms, and so Web three arises as a reaction to that. Um, and in one way, as I say, it is back to the future. It's how do we, from many of these uh, systems, uh, take back control? So there are many variants of this. There's obviously Tim Berners-Lee himself talking about his work at MIT and SOLID, and that's one vision. It's a line of research that we've been pursuing for some number of years, and in a previous video, more talked about some of the principles of human data interaction, which is sort of the theoretical framework we're looking at. But the instantiation of that that we're looking at is a thing called data box. We don't need to know your shopping history, we just need to know whether you are um, a big spender, medium spender, or a tight one. Right? That's, maybe that's all we care about. But I think we need to look at why a data box. So a lot of the concerns around Web3 is people are monetizing the data that we're giving them and we're not getting fair value. And that's one concern. I think you know each Facebook user is asserted to be worth $35 to Facebook in terms of advertising revenue, essentially. Um, and people are going, well, can I get my fair share of that? Well, it's like, well, what's your fair share of $35? You know, is it going to change your life, right? So at an individual level, the monetizing of the data, I find as an economic incentive, a bit spurious. Um, those who make substantial money on the internet by being influencers and getting paid for it, they will continue to do that. And by their very nature, they're essentially producing curated content and they're getting paid for it. And that's fine. It's not their personal data that's getting monetized. So I'm always slightly dubious about the economic argument about this. And I actually come at it from a, lot, a different set of angles. And one, the first and foremost one is privacy. And actually, we just start with the law. Um, we don't have to get into ethical debates. The law, <coughs> data protection regulation being the most recent in Europe, uh, lays out the basis on which data should be processed. So I want to take an example. If I have uh, a fancy new Internet of Things light switch in my house to control a fancy new Internet of Things bulb, then you would think that while they both talk the internet protocol, which is what I want them to do, why on earth do any of these packets need to leave my home? That's the simple question, is why do they need to leave my home? And the answer is, of course, is they don't. Now, if I want to be able to switch my light on from remotely, from on my mobile phone when I'm out and about, then, then the question is, how does my mobile phone send IP packets to that? Whilst it looks like an ordinary light switch, We've actually got a post in there, which goes to the right web page to turn the lights on and off. In Databox, we take the view that while you might want to have a server that's looking at that data, and we'll get to why in a minute, then it should be in your house. Um, and that there is no need for the data to go beyond that. And in the, under data protection law, we're supposed to do privacy by design and by default. Uh, and that means that, you know, my view is that if that means you can build a thing without sharing the data, then hmm, I think the law says you're supposed to do that. Now, at this point, the, the, those big companies will say, we'll get your consent to share the data because actually we, need, we want the data for other purposes. So the fact that they can get when light switches switch on and off, well, what can that tell them? Well, I can tell, I tell them when you're at home, start telling them which room you're in, especially if they start doing correlations across devices. So we start getting into inferences about people. Um, people have been worried about this with their online web habits and shopping habits. This is nothing compared to being able to know every time you go to the toilet or something. Um, and it's unclear what companies will try to do with that data. So I would just start off by saying they don't need it. There's, it's not like you're going to get paid a lot of money for this. So uh, why don't we just build architectures in the future in which we keep this data in the home where we can? So and that, there's a fundamental privacy argument there. The second one, again, comes about due to the law. I, 
I'm entitled to uh, take my, all my personal data and process it however I see fit. Whereas a company, uh, it actually can find itself getting into difficulties if it has too much personal data, it gets itself into a regulatory morass. So any company that holds, that engages in financial transactions has to not just comply with data protection laws, they have to apply, uh, um, comply with financial services laws as well. So you imagine a company that tries to hold all your data, it's got a regulatory nightmare of what it can and cannot do with that data. So actually in Databox, we view this as a place as where if the data exists online, you can pull that data in, so you can bring it down through um, the APIs that are available. If it's generated in the home from, from IoT devices or you type it in, you, know, you give it the data, it's, uh, it has access to your calendar and your uh, address book and other bits and pieces, and it can communicate with your phone, then it can start to mash up data from different sources. Imagine I could take where my phone is, the reading from the PIR sensors, the little passive infrared sensors that many people have in their homes as part of a burglar alarm system, um, lighting controls, heating controls, any controls in the house, and start to understand and build a model of that user in that house within the, da within the data box, within the house, privately, a private model. Um, and someone might say, well, if we could um, process that data, it's very important here, if they could process that data, uh, then we might be able to provide you with some value. So say, for example, someone could supply an application that would run on the data box, which would be a burglar alarm uh, application, which is, right, we'll take your PIR sensors and everything else. Uh, burglars will go around the house and not switch the lights on. And so we could build a really smart burglar alarm that could really understand what's going on. Yeah. It's probably going to get me going to the toilet in the night. But aside from that... Well, you know, it's, it's the are they downstairs wandering around. But then the flip side of that is exactly all those same data assets could be used for uh, an elderly care app. Today people are thinking of Internet of Things services with a cloud at the centre and a device in the home. And they limit themselves to the functionality that uses a reasonable amount of bandwidth because they can't absorb all the bandwidth on the internet connection out of the home. They often assume far too much. I have a one device that does a TCP connection every second. It just sits there and polling the cloud service to see if it's, so I should say, it's on a separate network which I now prevented access in the internet. But it tries to do that. And actually it, doing that on my local area network, I don't care because it's not a problem. But if, those, if all those connections were going up and down over my broadband link, it's like, how many of those devices before I start, it starts impacting my life? And that's a pretty trivial example. So people are limiting what they imagine IoT devices can do uh, in the home uh, because of the, oh, better not use too much bandwidth. But on the other hand, taking video from multiple cameras, processing it in a data box, which you know, could be a Raspberry Pi doing this, it's not talking about high-end computes here, could provide new functionalities that people are currently not thinking about. So there's, there's that as well. And finally, when it comes to looking after the home, um, I'd like my light switches to work when the internet's down. Um, I'd certainly want my burglar alarm to work when the internet's down because the first thing burglars hit is the power and the telecommunications coming out of the house. So um, I really would like it not to rely on a cloud service for all sorts of reasons. And more so when we get into these applications for looking after the elderly in their homes. So let's relate this back to this Web3 movement. I think Web3 is about you know, getting control back of your data and understanding how to process it for your own value and publishing what you want to publish. And I, 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 it's a good example of where the raw data that I have, um, I might want, not want to publish, but I might be quite happy to publish some um, statistical data that's derived from it. So, you know, for advertising purposes, if someone wants to know whether you should advertise to me, you know, tea or something, yeah, um, then I'd be perfectly happy if they supplied an app which used my electricity monitoring to notice how many times I boiled a kettle in the day. But what I don't want to do is share the data of what time of day and how long I boiled it for and everything else. But I'll, I'll happily share that on average I have four cups of tea a day. I mean, that's not really a concerning personal statistic. But sharing exactly when the kettle got switched on and off every day publicly with possibly others could get hold of it, that then gives an occupancy pattern to the household. So the data can be reused for purposes that it wasn't intended for. And that's, I think, where a lot of the uneasiness around the data in the world is at the moment, is that we're giving, we engage in these transactions and sometimes we hand over data and a lot of the data gets monitored 
um, as we use a website. All sorts of things are monitored just as we move around the website. Um, and uh, while we have to share some data to get the job done, it's got to the point where we no longer have any idea what the data is being used for. And it's not clear it's being used to our benefit. And so we really want to get control of that. But as I say, I don't quite believe the economic argument of my data will suddenly be worth, you know, I can't live off my data. Uh, I might get a few beers out of my data or something. But I'd much rather open up much greater value in this data ecosystem by completely transforming it to be more of this Web3 model of applications, you know, send the code to my data. I might share some statistics from you, but actually it may just be your code running on my data and that's the transaction. I get something I want and I pay you money for that. And it's a product. Remember those things, products before we just had services, everything's a service. We have all sorts of marvelous apps on this, right? All sorts of crazy things that are really useful to us and they are remotely managed and they're remotely updated and all of the problems that people talked about, oh, you couldn't possibly run your own email service at home. It's like, well, no, because the usual way of running it is become a Linux systems guru and start from there, right? Whereas in fact, if any of these companies applied their knowledge and experience to you know, actually providing privacy preserving solutions in the home, they can do it and they can make it just as easy to use. We have now moved to a world where we can support very complex technologies you know, WhatsApp, for example, is one of the world's most complex crypto protocols you can imagine. WhatsApp, Signal and, and Co. have decided this is a bit of a problem. Do you know that? Do you care? No, it just works, right? Because all of the complexity of the double ratchet algorithm and all the way in which it does privacy protection, you didn't have to engage in it. You didn't have to become a system administrator. You didn't have to generate public keys. It was all just done. And the bringing of the, the automation and the, the digital, that the digital has given us to provide these technologies in the home. And so Web 3.0 is exactly that. There's, the argument that we could all just run a Linux box at home, it's like, yes, we could, but we would all have to become Linux box experts. But actually, there's no reason why we can't do what we do with the phone apps today, which is remotely support them and have all of this great technology in our own homes and actually providing new functionality Take social media. Well, actually, most people, they want to do social interaction. You want to talk to like 30 or 40 mates and find out what they're doing. Again, that doesn't require the publishing of things on walls. So we've seen that even within the Facebook family of people moving from Facebook to WhatsApp for a lot more of the discussions or Snapchat and these other more things where by default you're talking a smaller social group. And supporting those sorts of technologies between in a Web3 way by building a peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, well, actually, we did do that quite a number of years ago, and it was called Skype. So we had it, and then it got acquired by Microsoft and turned back into a centralized service. Now, if you're truly paranoid at this point, you would identify that, of course, at the point that they did that, they also allowed government agencies to get access to it as well. So for the truly paranoid out there, one of the reasons, and lots of people have advocated moving to a peer-to-peer -peer network, is for those who are very worried about you know, state surveillance. So we don't need to know your shopping history, we just need to know whether you are um, a big spender, medium spender, or a tight one. Right? That's, maybe that's all we care about, right? Um, and, so right? and this is not how they're going to do it. The next thing we could do is we could say, well, why can't we use the same kind of protocol to establish keys 